because I've been working on this book and I have this chapter which um, I'm developing. Just, we started out as a chapter about Deleuze's, Shio Deleuze's theory of political imagination. And I think this is a very neglected aspect of Deleuze's thinking and theory, the fact that he did dedicate quite, quite a lot of thought to thinking about imagination and the nature of images and the power and the politics of images. Of course, we know about the two volumes which he wrote on cinema and they're widely referenced, especially in cinema studies and books to do with cinematic or photographic images. Um, but these are, these are works which uh, are not normally tackled in terms of debates and theories about the embodied imagination and embodied Im images so much. So I was in, and I think there's a, there's a certain amount of work still to be done, surprisingly enough, on, on Deleuze and his theory of imagination. But it was through Deleuze that I got interested in the work of um, T.E. Lawrence, or more especially perhaps Deleuze's reading at least of of Lawrence to begin with. So he has this essay in, in uh, Essays Critical and Clinical called The Shame and the Glory, which is um, a very powerful account of um, the power itself of T.E. Lawrence's writing and of the role of imagination and of the force of images in Lawrence's theory of, of war and military struggle. Um, T.E. Lawrence, of course, is known as, well, he's more popularly known as Lawrence of Arabia on account of the, the film by that name by David, David Lean from the, the 50s, I think. But he's also um, known as the, the, the inventor, as it were, of the whole theory of, of guerrilla war, which became so influential in the development of, of war and political and military struggle in the 20th century. And just in case anybody doesn't know, the story is Lawrence is this British agent who goes during the First World War in 1916, he goes out to the Middle East to participate in the Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire and the Turks. And um, if you believe Lawrence's account of his participation, basically leads that war and um, instructs the Arabs and teaches the Arabs how to fight, how to use the, the space of the desert, um, how to use their weakness against um, the Turks to, to, to win. And then he comes home uh, back to Britain after that, and he pens this incredible um, literary account of this participation, of this time that he spends there. It's called The, the Seven Pillars of Wisdom. And it's also, as well as a, a theory of um, guerrilla war, and as well as an incredible biography and, and um, an account of his his time there, it's also a very homoerotic book, situated with his you know, love and desire for, for Arab men and boys. And um, while I was reading it, I also started to think about the comparisons with the work of Jean Genet's uh, Prisoner of Love, a much later work, of course, but which in many senses um, directly recalls Lawrence. And indeed, which I noticed that Deleuze draws on also in this short essay on T.E. Lawrence. So Deleuze in his essay compares Lawrence directly with Genet and kind of uses Genet as a kind of prop for his account of the importance of the power of imagination and of the role of images in um, guerrilla war. So my interest gathered or developed from that. And then I started to read um, Guattari on um, Genet. Uh, Guattari has a chapter on um, Genet in, in one of his books. And I was thinking, I, at, the, at that point, at this point in the development of the research, I was thinking about this chapter as a kind of analytic of the, the relations and differences between um, Genet versus uh, Lawrence on the question of the, the power and importance of imagination and the role of images in political and military struggle. But then I began to think about the fact that, you know, these are also two figures who are absolute icons within um, queer theory and queer studies. And the fact that, for example, Lawrence was such a huge influence, such a huge figure in a way in the life and work of uh, Eve Sedgwick. You know, Sedgwick, when she was a, 
a teenager even was writing poems about Lawrence, which were just recently published, in fact. Um, and she, he appears and reappears in her work in various places, as well, of course, in many other different um, queer theorists and places in queer studies. And then I also began to think about the role of um, Genet in queer theory and queer studies, especially in the work of um, the, the equally important Leo Bassani, um, many of whose uh, texts are very much inspired by the work and, and life of Genet. So then the chapter began to, to change in a way. And given this, the iconic value of both Lawrence and Genet to queer theory, it became less of a chapter about these two figures and their works and the centrality of images and imagination in their works, but more a paper and chapter about the political imagination of queer theory as such and of, of what it might mean to queer the political imagination, depending to some extent on whether we read Chenet or whether we read Lawrence or, or whether we read authors that were influenced by Lawrence or authors that were influenced by Chenet. Perhaps. So this, this chapter is very much an outcome of this line of reading and this, this line of research and um, preliminary, very drafty kind of writing. Anyway, to cut to the quick, my conclusions are that there are different takes on what the political imagination is in queer studies and on what queering the imagination entails, including between these two icons, Genet and Lawrence, because regardless of how similar their lives were both going out to the Middle East to participate in political struggle, both being kind of queer in their life and queer in their writing. There are nevertheless these, these very big differences in the, in the things which they argue about the nature of the role of imagination for political struggle. For Lawrence, the imagination is very much a kind of a, a power of the elites, of, it's a power of, powerful individuals and groups, individuals like himself, essentially. Lawrence sees himself and depicts himself in this book as uh, creating and projecting images which function like weapons in a war to, to free a particular people, in his case, the Arabs. While for Genet, politics is, is kind of the opposite, or the relation between politics and imagination is kind of the opposite on the surface at least. It's about submitting your imagination as an individual to that of a collective. And in Genesis, case, that, that was of course the, the Palestinians. I think this massive um, gap or difference and conflict in, in ways of thinking about the imagination is also then what leads Edward to Edward Said's outright dismissal of um, the importance of Lawrence, who he just sees as a Eurocentric and colonial figure parasitic upon the, the life and struggles of the Arabs and his direct application of um, Genet as a much more authentic and truly political as well as you might well say post-colonial figure and theorist of the political imagination given the ways in which Genet appears to submit his own imagination to the imaginary of a people other than himself. Um, but also, I think within institution, beyond these two icons, within the institutionalized forms which queer theory has taken within the academy, um, it seems to me that there are significant different takes on the political imagination and what queering images entails. And the paper that I've written so far is an attempt to draft, to describe those and taxonomize those different takes on what queering images means in queer theory. It's clear that queer theorists most often understand the task of queering as bound up with the problematic of dominant imaginaries. Queer studies depicts itself generally in terms of the imagining of new and different alternatives to present ones, the crisscrossing of identities and desires, as Eve Cedric herself puts it. It aspires to be against the norm and working to destroy normalizing imaginaries by creating new images of other possible worlds, perhaps to some extent in ways that um, compare with the, the previous paper that we just heard. It also aspires to iconicize, to coin a phrase, the non-normative errors which normalizing regimes create, the image of error itself and, the, and of the abject 
and to redeploy those images of error and the abject as signs from the future of those possible worlds. This is a way of thinking about error that you can find and the future and of the imagination that you can find, especially in the work of Bersani, who is reading Genet to make these arguments and claims about error and abjection. Although I think also the, the ghost of Foucault is still very much present there, thinking about Foucault's um, wonderful introduction to a preface, I think it might have been to Congrium's on the normal and the pathological. But queer theory also aspires to destroy particular images, images which normalize. The image of the child, for example, in the work of um, Lee Edelman and his now famous book, No Future, where he talks about fucking children. Fuck Annie, fuck the way from Lemis, fuck the poor innocent kid on the net, quote, as he um, argues we ought to do in No Future. So queer, the queer theory sees itself fighting regimes of power which limit our imaginations and which work by governing our imaginations as subjects. And the queer theorist sees itself as existing outside the image of the norm, fighting not for inclusion, but the destruction of those images and for a future which will free the error from regimes which would work to normalize it. In this way, you could say that I think that it's similar to dominant discourses on political imagination upon the left today. The idea that it's the task of the left to mobilize imagination in a titanic struggle with a spectacle of power, which would otherwise control the images of which we are capable. I think this is a way of thinking about the relationship between imagination and power, which goes back at the very least to the board in 1968, and which you can encounter in many, many different texts um, authored since then. When you think about the work of Mark Fisher, for example, or the work of Franco Bifo Berardi, uh, and many others, you find similar ideas, similar claims, similar ways of depicting the predicament of leftist struggle today and the role of imagination and the, also the, the tragedy and predicament of, of um, the role of images. The depiction of a left to which the imagination itself belongs as a weapon in a struggle against dominant imaginaries and against powers which would work to limit the imaginations of those of us whom it subjects, preventing deliberately as a strategy the emergence of alternatives. My argument is that this representation of the problem of political imagination is itself kind of the problem. It doesn't really do justice to the complexities of the problem of political imagination today. In effect, what these discourses do, whether they're simply in queer theory or in wider areas of leftist theorizing is to mask the very nature of the problem. And sometimes I think queering itself can function as a kind of mask for power. And in terms of developing this critique, I'm still very influenced by the work of um, Foucault and especially the history of sexuality and the introduction to the history of sexuality, which of course is massively influential in queer theory for what it says about the role of sex as um, a regime of truth and the organization of power in the modern era. But I think it's still an incredible, incredibly misread or less read or underrun text for what it says about things like, for example, the, um, the power of the liberal imagination and the role of imagination and of images in the, the development of liberalism as a regime of power. So if you remember, but in that, in that text, the intro, Foucault describes liberalism itself as a kind of devious regime of power, which is an interesting adjective to use in context of queer theory, given how it's about reclaiming deviousness. A more, um, more imaginative than any other, he describes liberalism as. Not destructive, but creative, and deploying masks itself to hide itself. This is the, this is the, the language, this is the discourse which he uses to describe the problem which liberalism poses for the left back there in the 19th 70s today. And I think it's a problem which in many ways remains with us today. We don't really know that we see the full nature of liberalism itself. And we tend to believe still in mythical understandings and depictions of what it is and how it works, as well as mythical understandings of what the left and its various elements and wings entails. And I think in that sense, there's still a problem also upon the left of what I would call self-image. How, we, how the left sees itself 
and how different theories within the academy see themselves as functioning to um, support political struggle. And in that context, I got really interested in one of uh, a recent work within the queer tradition by Kaji Amin. It's called Disturbing Attachments, and it's an incredible book. It's basically a 200 page demolition, well, a very generous and loving demolition of the work of Jean Genet um, and of queer studies and queer theory itself. It's a kind of also a telling of the story of his falling out, his disenchantment with queer theory and queer, stu queer studies, where he really attacks Genet and other various icons in queer studies and queer theories. And queer is why it is that queer theory has iconicized figures like Genet, who sexually exploited young boys, especially young Arab boys, and who sought domination and who clearly in, in the case of Genet, if you read his works carefully, it's kind of like a literary Jimmy Savile to make a cultural reference, which will um, resound on British years at least, a character who sought domination and control in unequal power relationships. And in that ways was very similar to the T.E. Lawrence, who um, Said argues Genet is so different from. Both the works of, of Lawrence and Genet are full of erotic desire for the exploitation of children. And in, in effect, they did exactly what Lee Edelman argues should be done metaphorically. That is to say, they fuck kids, which also problematizes the very idea that Edelman's um, claim is itself a metaphor. Why idealize figures who imagine, whose imaginations were so full of fantasies of fucking children and who indeed did fuck children? This is the, one of the questions which Kaji Amin poses for us in his book, um, Disturbing Attachments. Are you there? Can you still hear me? Yes, Julian, but uh, Good. The, it's already 15 minutes, so. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm happy, to, <laughs> happy to cut short. Yeah. Yeah. Can you conclude, okay. summarize? Um, yeah, so, I mean, then I end on the question of the mask and what, what queering images and queering the imagination should mean in relationship with masks. Does it mean masking or does it mean stripping the mask away? And then I talk about the importance of the role of masks also in the work of Lawrence and Genet. So if you read The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, you find that it's, it's uh, that poignant points in the text. It's Lawrence himself describes himself as masked. He describes the Arabs also as masked. And he describes his relationship to the air and the environment and the atmosphere as if, as one of wearing a heavy mask. And then I talk about uh, Jean Genet and his, his uh, drama, his play, The Blacks, which is also all about masks. It's a play which entails the, um, a white audience watching a black um, cast half of whom are wearing masks, performing the white gaze upon black bodies. Um, and then of course, mask theory, it's, masks are, are also endemic within wider discussions in queer theory, in Sedgwick's work, for example, on the closet, etc. So yeah, I guess my, the question I, want, I, I, I pose is whether queer theory functions as a mask for power or as a, as a can, can function as a means for the stripping away of the, the mask, which is of course to say the image of power. 